I uh, am somewhere between United States time and British time. And I'm upside down at the moment. So if I fall asleep during this morning's message, I hope you'll understand. Um, let's pray. Father in heaven, have mercy on us by coming close to us, I ask. Bless us with your presence. Let this time be a blessing for your glory. I would ask that you'd be merciful to me and grant that the limitations of fallen humanity would not prevent you from doing the work that we all need done in our lives at this point in time. We thank you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm not always sure where to begin. So with your permission, I'll begin at the beginning. Um, I wonder if you would mind turning in your Bible to the book of Exodus. It seems to me to be a biblical proposition that for every individual, sooner or later, decision time comes. Now, God is good, you know. As we go through life, he allows us opportunity to decide for him here or there, along the way. At some stage, and we can't always know when, the time to decide comes. And the protagonist in our account this morning had that experience, Exodus chapter 4. And we shall pick it up in verse 19. We read here about the man God tried to kill. The Lord said to Moses in Midian, Go, return into Egypt, for all the men are dead which sought your life. Now you know what's really interesting about God? God is gracious. Now, in looking at this story, I'm mindful that we've just bumped into a fellow who is guilty of murder. I don't know how many murderers you have met. I've met a few. Not a lot, but a few. As a pastor, you meet these kinds every now and then. I was pastoring one church that had a very active prison ministry group involved with it. Prison ministry is a wonderful thing that I hope you get involved in someday. Have you had the chance to get involved in someday? And uh, our church had at least a couple of serial killers as church members. Uh, they weren't serial killers while they were attending church. In fact, they never attended church. And they never will. One of them is on what they call in the United States death row which means that he has been sentenced to die, to be executed for his crimes. And the other one, interestingly enough, who has killed many more people, is not on death row. He's just imprisoned until the day he dies. They'll carry him out of prison one day in a box. Now, these fellows who have become Christians since their murder sprees, their respective murder sprees, are repentant. I know that. One man spoke to me about the crimes that I have committed, his words. And he told me through tears how sorry he is to God for what he has done. The other man didn't know I was coming. I went to visit him. And when they're on death row or in prison for the rest of their life in maximum security, you can't just call ahead or text, I'm on my way. They don't have telephones or smartphones or any kind of phones. They don't know. You can't make an appointment. And I just turned up and I arrived at his cell and these cells have rectangular windows in the doors about this long and this wide. As I approached the door and looked through the window, there this man was on his knees with the mattress, the thin foam rubber mattress on his bed, turned back over on top of itself and spread around him were his books, that is his Bible 
a Bible, con uh, Bible concordance, I believe, uh, uh, Bible commentary, I think some spirit of prophecy books. There he was on his knees with a pen in his hand and a pad before him studying the Bible. He wasn't putting on a show because he didn't know I was on my way. But that man had been converted. Aren't you glad that in this world, when you do something wrong or something bad, even that bad, that God is still prepared to forgive you? Isn't that great? I hope you never need to experience that kind of grace. But those that have needed to and have wanted to have done so. They were murderers. Ah, murderers. One of them still waiting, wondering every day, is this the day I'm going to get word that they're going to stick a needle in my arm and flood my body with drugs that will kill me? That's a whale of a cloud to live under. What's interesting, Moses was as much a murderer as my two friends. But there's something about grace, you know. He didn't go to prison. God forgave him and let him go right on. It's not wrong for the justice system to do what the justice system needs to do. But today, Moses would do prison time, probably quite a few years. Then there was rather a different system. I'm not saying Moses should have gone to jail. All I'm saying is that Moses was a murderer. And yet, God was able to use Moses in a great way. Here he's in the process of using Moses now. Moses, go back down there to Egypt because I want you to be front and center in the liberation of my people, enslaved for several hundreds of years. Moses, get down there, square off with Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go. Moses, verse 20, took his wife and his sons and set them upon an ass, a donkey. And he returned to the land of Egypt, and Moses took the rod of God in his hand. And the Lord said to Moses, when you go to return to Egypt, see that you do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I've put in your hand. But I will harden his heart that he shall not let the people go. That's a phrase that troubles some people. I will harden his heart. And there are people who have the idea that Pharaoh was merely a pawn in God's drama of the ages, that he never had a chance, that God hardened his heart as though he might have had a softer heart except God messed things up for him. Well, the fact is that God hardens a person's heart by sending light. And as God sends light and an individual rejects that light, the individual makes her own or his own choice to harden one's heart. That may be an unconscious choice. I don't know that Pharaoh ever said, you know what, I want my heart hardened. But what he did do was say no to God. And when God sends light, a plague that reveals that God is the God of heaven, that light should have softened Pharaoh's heart. But Pharaoh shook his puny fist in God's face and therefore his heart hardened. Hey, don't make the mistake of hardening your heart. When God yet sends you an opportunity to repent, when God speaks to your heart, when God floods your pathway with light, He's wanting your heart to be softened so your heart can be malleable, moldable in the hands of God. Pharaoh, on the other hand, said no to God, shook his finger in God's face and said, I'm not going to change, I'm not going to repent, I will not let those people go. That wasn't smart. God said to Moses, you shall say to Pharaoh, thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say to thee, let my son go that he may serve me. And if you refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay your son, even your firstborn. Serious. Well, now, decision time. Moses was making his way from Midian to Egypt, and I don't know where on the route he was. The Bible says... It came to pass, by the way, in the inn, that the Lord, that would be like a hotel. And I know that's an old, crude version of what we would call a hotel. This wasn't the Beaches Hotel down there, you understand. But it came to pass, by the way, in the inn, that the Lord met him, Moses, and sought to 
kill him. Isn't that something? When you think about the man God tried to kill, I mean, wow, maybe we're talking about some hard-hearted old king who, who, who installed idol worship in Israel, or maybe we're dealing with somebody like Judas, or something like that. But no, the Bible says that God met Moses in a hotel room and was about to turn out his lights. Now, why in the world would that happen? Well, this isn't the burden of my discourse this morning, but for the sake of it, let's uh, identify this. It says in verse 25, Then Zipporah took a sharp stone, Zipporah being Moses' wife, and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet and said, Surely... A bloody husband art thou to me. So he let him go. Then she said, that God let Moses go. Then she, Zipporah, said, A bloody husband thou art because of the circumcision. Now, I don't want to make too much of that. You know, back then it was necessary for the Hebrews to circumcise their sons. Now, today it's not necessary. It's not mandatory. But then God had said, You must do this as a sign of the fact that you are my covenant people. Now, you might not think it's too terribly important to do everything that God says. You might think it is, and that would be good. But for some inexplicable reason, Moses chose not to perform that delicate surgical procedure. Now, somebody suggested to me that he chose not to at the say-so of his wife. And one day, it was interesting, one day a fellow coming to an evangelistic meeting I was holding, he suggested that to me. And if you dig deeply enough into the writings of Ellen White, you will find that somewhere she says that that's the case. Moses didn't do it because of his wife's influence. Now, that didn't get him off the hook. This was God's will, and he didn't carry it out. He flat out refused to do God's will. And God met him in the hotel one day and squared off with him and said, That's it, Moses. You are about to die. Now, I don't want you thinking that uh, because this morning you might have put a foot wrong that God's necessarily going to meet you here at Pontins and threaten to kill you. I don't think so. Uh, this was an important demonstration for our benefit and, and in the context of what was going on. What was Moses on his way to do? He was on his way down there to Egypt. For what? To be used by God in the greatest movement of the people of God in the history of the then known world up until that point. In other words, God had chosen Moses to do something great. Yet Moses, even in this small point, was in rebellion against God. Imagine, imagine Moses going down there to Egypt and saying to Pharaoh, Pharaoh, there's something God wants you to do. And if you don't do it, God will kill your firstborn son. And imagine Pharaoh saying, hey, hang on, who are you to speak? Now, now, there's something you have refused to do. You're a hypocrite, Moses. And Pharaoh would have been justified in hardening his heart against God. God couldn't have that. He needed the person down there in the heat of the battle to be right with him. Now, Zipporah stepped in, performed the surgery. Everything worked out okay. So God did not kill Moses as he intended to do. But moving on from that aspect of the story, let me just identify this small point before segueing into another. Decision time comes. Moses had a decision to make. God spoke to him and said, in essence, are you for me or against me? Are you with me or not? How is it with you? What's it going to be? Moses, it's time to decide. And Zipporah stepped in and helped Moses with that decision-making process. Moses went on his way. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know when it's going to come to you, but sooner or later you're going to have an opportunity to decide. There's something in the Bible calls the unpardonable sin. And for most people who go certain directions in their lives, and certainly you would never do such a thing, God will call and call and call, and he might stop calling after a certain time, having decided that you're just not going to respond. That was my experience. And one day, God met me, not in a hotel room, but in a bathroom. And he said to me, John, it 
is now or never. I must tell you, one of the things I appreciate about being in Great Britain is that I can use the English language. In the United States, I have to speak American. They don't speak English over there. You know, over there, the bathroom is where you go, where you don't take a bath in the bathroom, do other stuff. But now I can, it's difficult. You know, you say to people, um, well, I say to people, well, I, I uh, met God in a bathroom. And in the United States, that has a certain connotation that you don't want leaving in people's minds. They don't understand that the bathroom is a room where you take a bath. Funny. They have things like restrooms. I don't need a rest. <laughs> That's a relief to be here and just speak and be understood. There I was in a bathroom reading a book. And the book was, well, I'll tell you later what the book was. I was reading a book. It was about 2 o'clock in the morning. It might have been 3 o'clock in the morning. And I was reclining in the bath. In London, of all places. And God met me there. And he said, John, it's now or never. What's it going to be? Let me back up. Back up about as far as I can. I was born in a little town in New Zealand. And uh, probably my earliest memories. Probably. I can't say with certainty. But most likely my earliest memories were of going to church with my father. My mother to this day does not go to church. She's elderly now. My father, who died some years ago, was a faithful Roman Catholic. And I was born into this Roman Catholic family, the youngest of seven children. And my earliest recollections are of attending church with dad. My well, dad and my oldest brother and then my sister and my brother and my sister and my brother and my brother and me. My earliest recollections are of going to St. Paul's Catholic Church with the big altar up the front. And on the front wall behind the altar was a large life-size crucifix. Jesus hanging on the cross, his arms stretched out, two feet together with a nail through them, a little drop of blood down his side. It was a very sanitized crucifixion. A drop or two of blood on his brow, his head resting like this, dead on the cross. These are my earliest memories. Uh, five years old, I went to school, St. Paul's Catholic School. It was the closest, it, it was close to our home. As a matter of fact, for many years, we were the Catholic family who lived closest to the church and the church school. Five years old, I went to church, sorry, went to school down there. And uh, Mrs. Tremaine was my teacher when I was in the primers. Did you ever have the primers in England? I, uh, actually, correctly pronounced the primers, I suppose. But you start off in primer one and then primer two and then primer three and primer four and then standard one, two, three, four, five, and six. But by the time I got there, standard one, two, three, and four, then form one and form two. Anyway, it doesn't mean anything. And I went into, the, into first grade. First grade, that's where you start, right? And I went to first grade and Mrs. Tremaine was my teacher and she was as old as dirt. But, I mean, she was the oldest human being I had ever seen. <laughs> she was old. It's funny, you know, how you, how you think. I came across an old class photo of when I was in that early grades and she wasn't really very old at all. But boy, at the time, I thought she was the oldest thing, as old as Methuselah. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, I went to other classes and whatever. And going to St. Paul's School was, was a really a wonderful experience on some levels, and it was traumatic on others. I'll tell you about that in a minute. As a Roman Catholic, I loved my church. And when we went to school, the nuns educated us and instructed us in all things Catholic. Well, some things Catholic. And we'd go to Mass, you know. Oh, I would never miss Mass. And we'd uh, listen to the priest. I don't know that I'd ever learned much at Mass, but that's not really the, didn't seem to be the purpose of Mass. That's, that's Mass, I'm sure you know, I hope you know, is what Roman Catholics call their church service, Holy Mass. And... Uh, 
as I learned there in my school, I started to learn the tenets of the Roman Catholic faith. And uh, you know what happens when you're a kid, they tell you something, I could tell you that the moon is made out of cheese, and you go, oh, okay, and you just believe stuff. And so we just believed stuff. But as I got a little bit older, I started kind of to struggle with some of the things that I was learning or being told as a Roman Catholic. Now, when I got to about seven years of age, I became an altar boy. And, uh, you know, it's impossible for me to understand. I if you happen to be a former Roman Catholic, then you'll understand everything I'm saying. The altar boy is like the priest's assistant during Mass, the church service. And you dress up, at least we used to, in a, in a kind of a funny outfit, a little bit like priest's robes, you know. And we would sit on the step up on the altar, and uh, you know, I'd, I'd ring a bell at the time that the priest changed the bread into the actual body of Jesus. And I'd ring a bell when he changed the little altar wine into the blood of Jesus. And then I'd go and help during the communion service and various things like that, you know. As a matter of fact, being an altar boy gave us opportunity to have access to the altar wine. And uh, that didn't always work out very well, <laughs> particularly when the priest caught us drinking the altar wine. But anyhow, I was an altar boy. And in fact, I loved going to Mass and being an altar boy so much that at one stage, I went to Mass to serve, as what we call being an altar boy, every day for two and a half years. And I don't mean every Sunday. That would be child's play. Every day, because Mass happened on a daily basis. I had a streak going that I don't think anyone ever bested. Every day for two and a half years, that's about 900 days in church in a row. I was serious about it. And I even had thoughts of becoming a priest. I considered that for about five minutes one afternoon. <laughs> I just couldn't imagine living like a priest. And I don't mean not getting married. It just looked like a boring lifestyle to me. But I toyed with the idea. And my father, he so wanted me to become a priest. One of my sisters thought for a while about becoming a nun. She thought for about 10 minutes. And my dad was hopeful that she'd become a nun. And, and with every child that passed off the scene, you know, all of his hopes got passed on to the next child. And a couple of them, there was no chance. And then by the time he got to me, his little blue-eyed boy, literally speaking, dad was hopeful that maybe I would be the one. No, it didn't happen, at least not the way Dad hoped. So if you listen, if you're a Roman Catholic, and if you think, well, that might not always be a good thing because I listened when I went to funerals. And during the funeral service of the church, the priest would inevitably say, well, the deceased is now in heaven in the presence of God and the holy angels and is praising God and having a happy time. Then we'd go to the cemetery and we'd lower the casket into the ground and the same priest would say of the same individual, now we lower Joe's body into the grave where he will wait until the resurrection. And I'm thinking to myself, how can one guy be in two places at once? And I want to put up my hand and say, excuse me, Father, but, but you know you don't do that stuff. I couldn't figure that out. And then we would be told that hell would burn forever and ever and ever and ever. I mean, you'd burn forever if you went to hell. But, you know, I went to so many funerals and not one of them was ever consigned to hell. We even had to have had the holiest people in our town. And I knew some of them weren't very holy, but you know what us Catholics had? I'm fine with that. You need us with it. You know what us Catholics had? We had something called purgatory. And uh, my understanding of the doctrine of purgatory might not be perfect, but in essence, if you weren't good enough to go to heaven or bad enough to go to hell, you went to a holding place called purgatory and you would atone for your sins there. You'd do hard labor. I don't know. They have you breaking rocks in the hot sun, I don't know what they'd have you doing. I could never figure it out, but it was a place where you did hard time. And I didn't like that. I didn't like hot weather. I didn't want to go to purgatory. I could imagine me having a headache for a million years. 
I, and I, no joke, that's what I thought. And I just didn't like that idea. Purgatory. It seemed, it seemed uh, somewhat arbitrary. Uh, I didn't like the idea. So I, di- I didn't think you could possibly go to heaven and the grave at the same time. I didn't think God would burn someone forever and ever. That didn't, God is love. And if you don't stop that, you'll burn in hell forever and ever and ever. I don't know about that. And then purgatory. And then praying to saints. If you lost something, you pray to St. Anthony because he was the patron saint of lost things. If you were a piano player, you would pray to St. Cecilia because she was the patron saint of piano players. If you were a carpenter, St. Joseph, the patron saint of carpenters. When we would travel, we would make sure we had a St. Christopher medal in the car. And that was, I mean, that was back in the old days when inside the car there were surfaces actually made of metal and a, and a magnet would stick to it. And my dad, boy, he wouldn't travel anywhere in any car if he could help it that didn't have a St. Christopher medal in there because St. Christopher, the patron saint of travelers, would keep you safe while you travel. See, you would hardly even need Jesus because you've got all these saints to pray to. And I thought to myself, what in the world are we praying to saints for? If I lose my tennis ball under the house and I can't find it, Why talk to St. Anthony when all he's going to do is talk to God? I could just talk straight to God. I wondered about that. And there were a lot of other things I just couldn't figure out. You know something? Let Let me just suggest something to you. There's a good chance you don't realize how lucky you are, and I use that word lucky with your permission, to be able to go to church every week and take a Bible with you. Wow. We never had that. I went to my church every Sunday, and there are approximately 52 Sundays in every year. Some years, I guess, there are 53. And I went to that same church virtually every Sunday for 18 or 19 years. 52 times 19. What is that? 950, something like that. Not once did even one person take a Bible. Isn't that interesting? You don't need one. You don't need one attending that church. What would you do with it? No one knew. No one read the Bible. Hardly. Not many people. So as I got older, oh, there was another doctrine that used to really give me the willies. And that was the doctrine of confession. If you have sins, you go and see the priest. And at that time, you'd sit in a little room and the priest threw the wall through a gauze window in another room. And you would pray a prayer that said, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It has been maybe two weeks since my last confession. Here are my sins. And you'd say, well, I've been doing this and that and that and this and this and that and that and the other. One day my brother went to confession and he said, well, Father, I don't have anything to confess. I haven't committed any sins. And the priest said, that can't be. He said, no, no, I've been a good boy for two weeks now. I haven't done a thing wrong. And the priest said, no, no. And so my brother, under pressure, started making up sins. And the priest was saying, that's better. That's better. In whose world is that better, I wonder? I thought to myself, this can't be right. Saying you're conf- confessing the sins to a priest, the priest, that priest was a drunk. Now, I'll tell you this. <laughs> the Roman Catholic Church has come in for a lot of criticism because of the behavior of some of its priests. And I know better than to criticize any church for what its ministers do because, unfortunately, no church, not even ours, has ministers who are entirely angelic. However, I think I need to say in defense of my priests, our priests were good guys. As far as we know, there was no monkey business going on. Never, ever, ever heard anything like that coming out of our church. But what they did like to do was drink. And there were times that as the altar boy, we'd, I'd turn up for church, be waiting outside. These masses that we'd have during the day, an early, actually morning, that would be at 7 o'clock uh, Monday to Saturday. And uh, these, these church services that we would have, Usually only about five people would turn up and three of them would be nuns. Sometimes the five would be me, the priest, and three nuns. But many times we would turn up and we would be waiting outside and the seven o'clock would come and go. It'd be five past seven, it'd be ten past seven. And I knew that by ten past seven I needed to be on my way, knocking on the door of the priest's house. Father, Father, wake up, wake up. You gotta come over and do mass. And the priest would stumble to the door, bleary-eyed, bloodshot-eyed. Okay, I'll be right there. And then he'd stumble over. I knew that the night before he'd been down at the local pub propping up the bar drinking whiskey with his mates. And I don't say that to criticize because that's just what some people do. But I've got to go and say my confession? 
That guy ought to be on his knees asking mercy from God. So I had problems with this stuff. But what do you do when you're a Roman Catholic and you have the Pope and you have Rome and you are a Catholic and it's the true church and Jesus said to Peter, thou art Peter and upon this rock, and we all thought that Peter was the rock upon which Jesus built the church. What do you do then? I mean, you can't leave. I remember feeling sorry for Protestants because, I mean, what a waste of some perfectly nice people. If only they came to our church, then they could go to heaven. But as it is now, all these Protestants would go to hell. And it just seemed like such a pity. When one of my teachers, well, I had a teacher who was a Protestant, Miss Ingalls, she got married to a fellow named Lloyd Mounsey. She became Mrs. Mounsey. She was wonderful. She was the best teacher I ever had. But when she got married, she got married in a Protestant church. And we all had to get special permission to attend that funeral. And even when we got it, we didn't want to walk. I didn't go into that church. The roof might cave in on me as a Protestant church. A bunch of sinners go there. So that's how we thought, you know. I started to have my doubts. I started to wonder about this Catholic business. Dead people who go to heaven and the grave at the same time. Confession to priests. Praying to Mary. Praying to Mary. I mean, I said lots of prayers to Mary. But after a while, that'll get to you. And you wonder, is that really right? But what do you do? Well, I kept on going to the Roman Catholic Church. I tell you what happened. As I got older, I got to the place where I started referring to myself, not to my father, as a non-Catholic Catholic. I was searching. And I'll tell you what might have had even the greatest impact on me. I had the idea instilled in me that good people go to heaven. But the problem was, I wasn't good. I told you we lived closer to the church than any other Catholic family. So after confession, we didn't have very far to go to get home. But invariably, I would have sinned even before I got home. I had four brothers, and it was always the fault of one of them, you understand. But I knew that I would never be good enough to go to heaven. I'd never be good enough. I knew that. And yet, I was convinced that God loved me. I'll tell you how. It's funny. That crucifix I told you about, every time I went into the church, I would see that crucifix. Now, I'm not recommending that you go back to your church and say, well, it worked for Pastor Bradshaw, so let's do it in our church. No, no I'm not saying having crucifixes in our church is a good idea. But seeing Jesus, as it were, dying on the cross for me, I could never escape the fact that God loved me enough to let Jesus die for me. I could never escape that fact. And I don't know that I ever consciously tried, but life might have gone a little easier for me if I had forgotten all about that while I was living a life, you know, of rebellion against God. But I'd go into that church every day. I'd look up and there would be Jesus dying on the cross. And I knew God loved me. It's really important that you understand that God loves you enough that he sent his son Jesus to die for you a wretched death on a Roman instrument of torture. And so later on, I thought, well, I want to go to heaven. And I don't know if that was, in, is, it was selfish, unselfish, probably selfish, but that's not all wrong. You should want to go to heaven. But I will never get there because I'm bad and heaven is for good people. And I want to go to heaven. But, uh, and God loves me. I was motivated by the fact that God loved me, really, at least in a large degree. But man, I wasn't a good person. And so what are you going to do if you're a bad egg and you want to go to the place where only the good eggs go? Man, I was in trouble. And so I was open to looking for approaches that answered the big questions. Where are these dead people? Surely God doesn't burn people forever. It cannot be right to confess your sins to an individual. And how do you get good enough to go to heaven? Well, when I went to high school, I bumped into some guys who were associated with a Baptist church. Their dad, the biology teacher, a peculiar individual, was a Christian. And I understand that the, the mother, and she was... Uh, 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 their mother, um, she was a churchgoer too. And we'd go down to their house 
and hang out at this little youth group meeting, just a small youth group meeting. Oh, sometimes it might have been as many as 20, but I remember there being more like 10. And it was affiliated with a large church in the city up the road, and uh, they were largely Baptists. And so when they invited me to church, to go to church with them, a church service of some kind, not on Sunday morning, I would have to be in my church, of course, then I decided that, yeah, I'd like to attend this Baptist church. They said, we have good music, we have rock music. I said, all right, good music. This is for me, and I'll go there. Now, I will have to tell you this, and I hope I don't come off as inappropriate, that my, my primary motivation, and I was not in this alone. I had a friend named Tony, and he decided he would go to the youth group meeting at their church too, but we were motivated not just by the fact that they had rock music in the church, but there was a, there was a girl named Rosalind, and she was uh, far prettier than any Catholic girl who'd ever walked in and out of the church I attended. And Tony and I, we had it figured out that uh, Rosalind, who was very nice to us when she would come down with her older brother, Philip, to the youth group meeting, she was very nice to us and her friend Bronwyn. She was uh, not quite as good looking, but she was nice too. And we just knew that if we rolled up to that big shot church, we would just slam in the pews, man. And them girls would swoon and we'd be in. That's what we figured. And Rosalind couldn't resist our charms. Well, we went to church. I'll get the bad news out of the way first. Rosalind didn't even look our way. She had bad taste, obviously. <laughs> and so then I thought, all right, well, how's the church service? And you know, they did. They had, I'd, n I'd never seen drums in a church or bass guitar in a church. I had once seen a rhythm guitar in a church, but that was just for like a special music performance and that was scandalous. And here they were singing modern music with modern instruments. But you know, it didn't take very long and that, that kind of lost its appeal. Because I, you know, I was into real rock music and I said, well, this is just a pale imitation. I don't really think I need that. So that wasn't even really attractive to me after a while. Amateurs, I thought. And as I listened, they didn't seem to have the key that unlocked the padlock locking me out of heaven either. I'll tell you why. It's really fascinating. Um, I don't know who I thought I was, but at that time, uh, Tony and I both smoked. And so we would turn up to this church, this big Baptist church in the city where all the very biblical, and they carried Bibles to this church. That was pretty cool. And uh, we'd stand outside smoking our cigarettes, you know, like tough guys. And out would come Philip, the youth group guy, and he goes, oh, all right, all right, well, when you guys are done, come on in because we're about to get started. And we thought, what in the world? If we tried that at the Catholic Church, my dad would come out and boot our backsides. And the priest would be, hey, get rid of that. I knew it was wrong. And the Catholics would tell you, that's wrong. Now, if they saw you in the street with a beer bottle in your hand or whatever, they wouldn't say too much. But at church, you couldn't get away with smoking if you're a kid. And, and you know, I, I probably looked at this all wrong. They were being very gracious. But I saw them as just being weak. I didn't want to be smoking. I knew it was wrong. I needed somebody to tell me, hey, that you really shouldn't be doing that. I, I already knew that I was bad. I didn't want somebody putting their arm around me and saying, hey, bad guy, you're bad, and that's okay. I wanted somebody saying, there's a better way for you. Remember, heaven was for people who were good. And I wasn't good. And I wanted desperately to be good enough to go to heaven. And after listening a few times, I figured out, nah, these guys, they don't really have what I'm looking for. And then, a little bit later on, I attended, I got involved in Pentecostal churches. And I mean no disrespect, but you know, the Pentecostal church and the Roman Catholic church were like earth versus Pluto really different the music was loud and long and they, they people prayed I mean the, the minister would pray and the people would pray out loud at the same time then it was confusing and a hundred people would pray at once and they spoke in tongues and and it was wild for me it was wild and uh I got really interested because at least the, the worship was uh was very exciting and I was quite taken with this idea of speaking in tongues I mean something was going on and, and it was evidently from God because these were nice people after all. And uh, they prayed for me many times that I would receive the gift of tongues. Many times. And I prayed, oh Lord, I mean, everybody's getting this except for me. 
and I wish that you would give me this miraculous ability to be able to speak in languages that I don't know. And God never gave me the gift of tongues. You know what I suspect? I don't know this, but I suspect that if God had permitted me to receive the gift of tongues, I wouldn't be here right now. I'm convinced of that. I wouldn't be here. I know where I would be. But I never did, never did get the gift of tongues. And they'd come up and be healed. And the guy would, would, uh, would shout, put his hand on your forehead, shout some more, stamp on the ground, push you, and you'd fall backwards. And someone would be there to catch you uh, most of the time. And you'd fall backwards. And they'd lay you very gently down on the ground. And one day, uh, I was there this... Because a bunch of us Catholics, we would go to the Presbyterian Church for their prayer and praise, and we'd go to the Anglicans for their prayer and praise. Anglicans? Yeah, 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 not Presbyterians. And then uh, some other group, and then we'd go to the Pentecostals, and they weren't very far. They, they met in a school near our church, down the road a little bit. And one day, they were having a big healing service. And they said, and they had, uh, it's happened frequently, if you need to be healed of something, come on up. And I wanted to go up because it would have just been so cool to be healed. But the problem was, I wasn't sick. I had never been so disappointed for being in good health in my whole life. <laughs> Except for now, I thought, ah, I can go up. My friend Lindley, she wanted to go up for something, but I don't know that she was sick either. But I, I, I don't see very well out of my left eye. I, 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 see, I see men as trees walking out of my left eye. Not very clear. And I thought, thank the Lord, I've always wanted to be able to see out of my left eye, and this guy will heal me, and that will be awesome. And so I went up, and I don't remember if he asked me what the problem was or not. I probably, he probably did. And, uh, and I'm standing there, and I'm feeling a little bit nervous and a little self-conscious. I'm not one given to public display, you understand? And, uh, and he did his thing, and he made his incantation, and he put his hand on my forehead, and he pushed me like that. And I wondered if I would fall back or not, but at the end of the day, he gave me no option. And I fell back. I thought, uh-oh, but somebody caught me and laid me gently down. And I'm laying on the ground thinking, what do I do now? <laughs> because now I'm slain in the spirit. And you can't just bounce back up because that doesn't look very sanctified. <laughs> People who, who fall down on the ground, they lay down there for, I mean, sometimes 25 minutes. And I thought, how long will I give it? What's the right time to lay down here before getting up? And then I thought, wait a minute, my eye, have I been healed? And so I'm laying here on the ground, and I open my eye, and I go, I'm healed. Uh, wrong eye, that's the one I see good out of. <laughs> so I open up this eye, and I, I can't, oh man, I guess you've got to lay here longer before the healing <laughs> kicks in. And then I look around, and oh, my eye wasn't healed. After a while... I waited till the guy next to me got up, and then I got up, so I was at least as holy as him. And uh, I went back to my seat, and Lenny goes, how, how, are you, how are you doing? How's your eye? I said, oh, I think the healing's going to come later. I was told by somebody that the reason I did not get healed was that I didn't have enough faith, which really only served to reinforce the idea that I wasn't good enough to go to heaven. Now, there was a kid named James, and he went up there to get slain in the Spirit too, and he was into it, and then he was out of it. And then the next night, I saw him literally sitting on the side of the road in a gutter drinking what was probably beer out of a, a brown paper bag in a bottle inside a brown paper bag and so I thought well that didn't stick but what really did it for me was when I when the bass player in the band who was a friend of one of my brothers told me that the pastor's wife when she got angry <clears throat> she swore like a sailor and I thought no 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 I can do that already I need help not to do that. And evidently, these folks don't have what it takes, Holy Spirit or not. Man, 10 minutes. This is just, I'm in the, in the first 10%. I'll speed it up. And so I wondered, what am I going to do about this? I did not know. Now, along the way, I have a brother who had become a Seventh-day Adventist. And I was so sorry for him. Why would you become a Seventh-day Adventist? Uh, especially when you're already a Roman Catholic. And why would you go to church on Saturday? Well, what he did was he got dad's Bible, his, the Reader's Digest Bible that we never read down off the bookshelf and opened it up and he said, now you read here in Exodus chapter 20. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. And I said, no. And he said, which day is the seventh day? I said, Sunday. He said, really look on the calendar. And so I did. 
one, two, three, four, five, six. Saturday? I turned to my mother who was in the kitchen at the time. I said, Mom, is Saturday the seventh day? And she said, yes, yes, son. Everybody knows that Saturday is the seventh day. And this calendar was a calendar that my dad bought every year from the Catholic Church. So it had to be right. And uh, I said to my brother, well, why do I, my church, why do we keep Sunday instead of Saturday? He told me, because your church changed the day. And I said, well, if my church changed the day, then it must be okay. But I knew it wasn't okay because surely if the Bible says one thing, you should follow what the Bible says. And I was nine years old at the time and it started to eat away at me and I was having questions. Well, when I was 16 years old, I had a conversation with my brother, the Adventist, and he asked me, what do you believe about death? And it turned out that I believed what he believed and that scared me somewhat and about hell and about confession and about praying to saints. And every time my brother would say, well, that's what I believe. That's what the Bible teaches. And when he realized that we had a lot of common ground, he reached into a bag and pulled out a book and gave it to me. And he said, you should read this book. I think you'd like it. And I started on the introduction and I said, I will read this book. And I never did. Four years later when I was 20, he gave me a second copy of that book. (laughs) This time I started on page one and I never really read any further. And I put down the book and I never picked it up again. Well, along the way I had been to university and after university, I got a job in the radio industry as a radio DJ. And uh, I was a, a breakfast show host. I'd, I'd done a number of jobs, a few different jobs, but now I was on a breakfast show. And that's when you have the most listeners, you know. So that's the key radio show of the day. Um, and I was starting to get lots of job offers. And I was starting to, to, to do some little TV projects. And uh, it was then that I said, no, I'm not going to entertain these job offers because I'm going to leave New Zealand and travel. And it's like a rite of passage, or it was when I was a kid, that you leave New Zealand, you travel to the UK, live in London, earn pounds, spend them having the time of your life, and then you go back to New Zealand. And I said, I can do that. I'll put my career on hold, and I'll come to Britain. And I did, and I lived in London, and I got a job not in radio. I didn't even want to do that. I, I got a job actually doing just about everything that uh, upholds Seventh-day Adventist standards. I got a job in Earl's Court, Earl's Court selling pizza, uh, lots of ham on them pizzas. And then I got a job uh, before that, as a matter of fact, I worked in uh, Croydon for a while and I worked in Bromley for a while in department stores selling jewelry. Uh, costume jewelry and that was just a scam but what did I know and then I got a job as a coke pusher uh, driving a van around London filling up vending machines with coca-cola I mean I was doing all the highbrow jobs you know I also worked in haagen for about two weeks a little less than two weeks in Leicester Square I was scraping the bottom of the barrel but I was just here to have fun because while I was here that I really started searching. I went to church. I went to Catholic churches in several different countries looking for what I was looking for. And I couldn't find it. And I became convinced that when I went to Ireland, it would be there that I would really find what I was looking for. My grandmother was born in Ireland and I wanted to go and do some study about the the family tree, you know? And I, I went over there and didn't find out too much about the family tree, but I did find out something about what I believed. I was staying in a pub in Limerick And I said to the publican, where's the church? And he seemed surprised. But he told me. And on Sunday morning, I stumbled out of bed, down the stairs, out the door, off to St. Savior's Church, followed his directions. And I believed that here in Catholic Ireland, I would find meaning in my faith. And I would learn how to be good. And and all my questions would be answered. But I went to that church. There were about 20 people going through the motions, mumbling and mummering, and the priest was doing the same. And I sat there feeling dead inside. And I left, kicking stones as I walked down the street. And I stopped in the middle of the street. That was it. I had had enough. And I looked up, and I pointed my finger towards heaven, and I said out loud, God, I, Lord, I probably called him Lord, I am never going back to church again until you show me the truth now you need to be careful praying a prayer like that because God might answer it I had written a letter to my brother the Adventist and I had said 
you know, man, I am so searching. And as a matter of fact, I have been looking for that book you gave me. Well, when I got back from Ireland, guess what was waiting for me in the mail? Copy number three of a book called The Great Controversy. And I, uh, I was working at Earl's Court, I think, I think it was about the time, and then I wasn't. That job was over when the home show was over. And so I was out of work, and I was living in a crowded flat with all these people, and getting time in the bathroom, the room where the bath is, um, was not easy. So I'd wait till everybody went to bed and television went off, and uh, then I'd go take a bath. I'd fill up the bath with hot water, and no one would bother me at 1 o'clock in the morning, and I'd read my book, and conviction gripped me. Not only did I know the right day and all that, that was the lesser of it for me. But as I read that book, The Great Controversy, I came to learn that good people, I didn't need to worry about being a good person because good people don't even go to heaven. That's what I discovered. Righteous people go to heaven. Holy people go to heaven. I'd love to tell you a little story about being good, but I don't have the time. Uh, righteous and holy people go to heaven. And I read in this book that you don't need to sweat being good. What you need to worry about is accepting Jesus into your life and he'll bring his goodness. And if you got his goodness, then you don't even need to worry about your goodness. And I don't mean you go around being bad. I mean, when Jesus comes and lives his life in you, you can't be bad. Bad only happens when, like Peter, you take your eyes off Jesus and that's when you start to sink. But you cry out, Lord, save me. He grab your hand and lift you up. And I said, well, this is it. I embrace Jesus as my Savior and I get His righteousness and I follow the Bible as my rule of faith and practice. And there it is. So, I got on the telephone and I called the operator. Can you please give me the number of the Seventh-day Adventist Cathedral? And they said, no, I'm looking, looking here, she said, but I don't find an Adventist Cathedral, but I do find an Adventist church in W1, right in the city. I said, that's it, that's the cathedral, that's where everybody has their cathedral, right in town. And I got the number and I phoned the number and somebody answered the phone and said, bueno. And I said, what country am I in? Bueno. Now, I don't know if you know, I didn't know at the time, but that's when a Mexican will answer the telephone, the Mexican will answer the phone by saying, bueno. And I couldn't make myself understood and I didn't understand this guy. So I left my name and my number with him. And then after that, I figured, well, I'm done. I tried. I tried. I don't know where they are. They speak Mexican down there. Uh, what am I going to do? I didn't know at the time that they had a Spanish language congregation. What's that? But a few days later, a couple of days later, a man with a delightfully British accent called me. Hello, hello I'm calling for John Bradshaw, please. I said, this is him. Oh, yeah, this is him. I said, talking with a New Zealand accent. This is him. I see your clock. Don't try to intimidate me with that. <laughs> I got you. It's okay. Nah, you don't want to give me extra time. Oh, yeah, really? And then I'll ask for more. <laughs> I said, yeah, um, hello, pastor, this is John Bradshaw here. And he said, oh, John, lovely to meet you. Where are you? I'll come to you. I shall visit you. No, no, you can't do that. No, I'll come to you. And he, he really wanted to visit me, and which is interesting. When I became a pastor later, man, I was into visitation. I wonder if that had anything to do with it. And I, ag I agreed that I would, uh, I would visit Pastor Cox, this was Pastor David Cox. I don't know if any of you all know him. Um, but Pastor Cox called me and we arranged to meet at his church in London. It was called the New Gallery at the time uh, on Hidden Street, just off Regent Street, just up from Piccadilly Circus. And he said, we're having, you know, John, um, as it happens, we're having a Revelation seminar. And so why don't you come and attend the Revelation seminar? It seems like you'd be interested. And I said, oh, yeah, that's me. I'll come to the Revelation Seminar Pastor. That'd be cool. I'm into Revelation. And uh, <laughs> so he told me, he told me now the church, the church, you'll find it. You know, you come up to Hidden Street and take a left and you go along there and you will find a health food restaurant. And next to that is a staircase and we are up the stairs above the restaurant. And I thought, a cathedral above a restaurant? That's weird. But that's Okay. And so I went there and I expected, to, I expected it to be like football fans uh, heading towards Wembley Stadium. I just expected everybody would be draining into that church, a little bit like water going down a plug. 
But I got there and I didn't see anybody. I looked around, there's the health food store or restaurant and there's the stairway to heaven. And so, all right, up I went up the stairway and uh, I, there was nobody, didn't seem like there was anybody there really. And I arrived and I looked, got to the door and I looked in and sitting up the front was evidently the pastor and he was surrounded by in a little group about seven people, five old ladies and two men who scared the life out of me. I was convinced that they were both certifiable. I was panic stricken. And I slipped in, earring, long hair, beard, old overcoat that I bought from the op shop, jeans uh, with a hole in them. And that was before it was fashionable to have holes in your jeans. <laughs> old tennis shoes. I used to wear them playing squash. And I, I looked like a, 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 a Stephen King creation, really, I suppose, what it looked like. And I slipped in, I sat down in the back, watching from a safe distance. And I looked and I listened and there were these five old crazy ladies and these two crazy men. And I said, what in the world? I've come to church and here I am with the five loaves and the two fish. I mean, what is this? I couldn't wait to get out of there. And the pastor would look up every now and then nervous. He knew what was going on. He knew I was conflicted, internalizing a complicated situation. And he said to himself, I got to get to him. So right after they prayed, phew, he was on to me. And so we started the talk and uh, I told them a little bit of my story. Yeah, I read this book, Pastor. I don't suppose you've ever heard of it. It's called The Great Controversy. He said, oh, The Great Controversy. I think I've heard of that book. And, uh, and we got talking and I would ask him questions and phew, he turned in the Bible to a page and there'd be the answer right there. Boom. Wow. Well, let me ask you this question. Phew, boom. Right there. I had never seen that done before. It was better than magic. I was making up questions just to see him flip this way, flip that way, flip this way. Wow, was that cool. He told me church would be Sabbath uh, at the appointed time, come for Sabbath school before. And so I did. And they didn't all look like me at that church. Uh, I mean, they dressed nice. And I knew to dress nice, but... I didn't do nice back then. I was in England just to bum around, you know. And I came to church. It was such a wonderful church. There were people from about 45 different nationalities there. It was so cool. So for me being a traveler, to be in church with Romanians and Canadians and, and, uh, and even some British people and Brazilians and Spanish and Mexicans, and da, 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 da. it was cool. And I turned up in that church. This time there were a few more people there. And I, and I sauntered in, just a little bit scared. And uh, what do you know? People welcomed me like I was part of the family. And they loved me like I belonged. I remember there was this little lady from Cyprus. Funny, her name was Hi, but she was about this tall. Her name, I don't, I'm not, she, wasn't, she wasn't a dwarf or anything, but she should have been named Lo. She was little. And she'd come up to me like this and hug me right around the knees. And uh, I felt like I was her son or something, you know? And they included me and they made me feel at home and I started to grow spiritually. And I wasn't worried about bad or good now. I was worried about Jesus. I had Christ living his life in me. And stuff started falling off and changing and uh, Jesus really made me his own. That church loved me in even though I looked like I should have been out. You know, it's really important to reach out to people and welcome them in. It's just really important. White, black, somewhere in between, English speaking, some foreign language speaking, something else, welcome them and love them just as they are. And that's how those kind people were with me. There's a lot more I can tell you, but I want to tell you this. I was searching for Jesus. In the beginning, I didn't know I was searching for Jesus. I was just searching for answers to my questions. Along the way, you know, there's a few things I could have talked to you about, about my time in the radio and how I learned a few things in the radio industry. But that's, uh, that's a story for another time. God in his mercy saw that I was searching. Uh, I got to the place where I was laying in that bathtub in London, North London, in Hackney Borough, Stoke Newington, actually. And I knew that it was now or never. I knew it. I knew that I would never again have such a good opportunity to get it right with God. I was 12,000 miles from home. I knew virtually nobody in a city of somewhere between 7 and 10 million people. I was on my own. I didn't have to worry about impressing my friends. I wasn't playing rugby anymore. The truth of the matter was, I was a Catholic, but my religion was rugby. That, that, was, that was it for me. 
but uh, I wasn't playing rugby, so I could go to church on Saturday without having a conflict with rugby. I uh, had made some changes in my life just anyway, so there were some other uh, issues that I didn't need to be too concerned about, just lifestyle issues. Um, God worked it out that he had me right where he needed me. And then he took a calculated risk. He moved upon my brother to send me that copy of the great controversy at the right time, knowing that I could either accept what it said or reject it. If I had put that book down and said, I will get back to it, I would have gone back to New Zealand, back to my ch choice of jobs. I would have been at the top of the heap or somewhere near it in broadcasting, earning more money than I would have known what to do with. I would never have been able to say no to the world. And yes to God. But in his kindness, he had me in a bathtub at two o'clock in the morning. Just me, a book called The Great Controversy, and The Great Controversy. And as a searching soul who prayed occasionally, God was able to beat back the forces of darkness and surround me with light. What happened to my heart? Because I did not deny the night, my heart wasn't hard and my heart was softened decision time came and and through God's goodness I thought about I was laying in a bathtub I looked across the room I saw where the floor met the wall I thought about throwing that book across the room I did I remember vividly thinking this book because I knew my life was going to change my job would go I would be without a job and without prospects I was a broadcaster. It's all I knew. And if I became one of these Christians, I knew I would have to keep the Sabbath. There wasn't even a question about that. Because it's in the Bible. If you're going to be a Christian, you follow the Bible. I knew that. I knew my life would change. What would I tell my father? My father believed that my older brother was going to go to hell. And now I'm going to go right there with him. I would break his heart. What am I going to do? It was decision time. Man, there's only one thing you can do, and that's choose for Jesus. And you know what's something? I said to God, well, I love to travel. Gotcha. And, uh, but if I'm going to become one of these Christians, I'm done with traveling because I need, to, I need to drill down and learn about you. I'm done with traveling. I'm done with broadcasting. And I became a Christian. And from that day to this, I've done nothing but travel. And, and now I work in broadcasting. God doesn't take anything away. He just adds, he will give you the desires of your heart. He will. It's better with God. And you don't have to worry about being good enough to go to heaven. I'm not meaning to say, oh, carry on in your sin. and it's gonna, I don't mean that. But if all you want to focus on is being good enough, you'll never be good enough. But if you'll focus on f allowing Jesus to flood your life with his presence and cooperating with the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, you're going to find one day Jesus will look at you in the face and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And you'll say, me? And you will have experienced the mystery of the gospel, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. My friend, I want to encourage you by telling you it's always better when you go with God. And don't think for a minute, I'm trying to tell you I have arrived. I've got all the answers. I've got it all figured out. We are all in this together, growing daily towards the full likeness of Jesus Christ. We're all sinners in need of God's grace. But when we have God's grace, we've got that one thing that we really, really need. God bless you. Press on. Hang on to Jesus. Refuse to let go. Uh, there's more to say, but the most important thing is to say, yield. Surrender to him. Ask that he does his will in your life. And God will give you a testimony of what he's able to do in the life of someone who says, okay, let's do it your way. Pray with me, please. Father in heaven, we thank you today for Jesus, our Savior and our Lord. I am grateful for Great Britain. You brought me here, and it was here that I heard your voice. 
please, Lord, allow me to continue to hear your voice. And I pray for everybody in this room. We're in different places. Some of us raised in the church and close to you. Some of us raised in the church and just going through the motions. Some of us not raised in the church and whatever. But I pray that for all of us, our experience would be vibrant, that we'd choose to go your way and let you do your will in our lives, that we would put you to the test and then see that when we do it your way, yield to you, follow the Bible, allow you to live your life in us, I pray you let all of us experience that that is the way to go, that that is a life of blessing where you lose nothing and gain everything. We thank you today. We love you. We want to love you more. And we are convinced that you love us. We pray with grateful thanks. In Jesus' name, please say, Amen. Amen, amen and God bless you.